Welcome colleagues to uh, today's CG webinar, which is also 156-156 CG seminar in our CG history, which is now almost five years long. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Shalendra Raj Mehta, and I will introduce him in a moment. Uh, let me take you through the web protocols as we usually do. Um, remember that um, the webinar is recorded and will be posted online on the CG website in due course. A transcript of the chat function will also be posted as well. So the things you say in the chat and the things you say on screen will be remembered. Now, please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but please do so when asking a question. And we recommend using the speaker view in Zoom so that you can more clearly see who is talking. Now, to ask a question, use the chat function and type your question into the chat. That will enable us to identify you and to order the discussion subsequently. And when we reach the end of the presentation, at that point, uh, if your question is selected, you'll be invited in to ask it directly. And I'll give you a warning in the chat uh, when your name is about to come up in the Q&A session. Now, when you're invited to ask your question, please unmute yourself, switch on your video and state your name and where you are from. So that's the the organizational details dealt with, let's go to the substantive presentation. Uh, now, Dr. Shalendra Raj Mehta is currently the president and director and distinguished professor of innovation and entrepreneurship at MICA in Ahmedabad, India. Previously, he headed Oro University and Ahmedabad uh, University. Before that, he had stints at Duke CAE and the Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad and uh, Purdue University. So he has been around. He taught economics and strategic management at Purdue. His field of interest is partly that of entrepreneurship, industrial organization, information economics, experimental economics related fields. Um, and his research in these areas has been the subject of a full length review by The Economist magazine. But he's also interested in history and today he will talk to us about the brilliant dynamic experience of Indian higher education institutions from in the period between 500 BC or thereabouts, BCE or thereabouts, and um, in, for the next 1500 years or so. And that when Indian higher education was ahead of everyone else, um, when the great monasteries were um, operating, they influenced thought throughout East Asia and um, were the springboard for the passage of Buddhism into China, Korea and Japan with long lasting effects. And also, as I think Shalindra will tell us today, had influences also in the West. So at this point, let me hand over to him and allow him to tell us all that he knows about this topic. Thank you, Simon. Absolutely wonderful to be presenting in this uh, seminar. Uh, I was very much looking forward to it. And I must confess, I've done my homework like a good student. I've prepared for several days. But this is part of a much longer project that I've been working on for the past eight years or so to really tell the story that I'm going to be sharing with you today. Um, I've shared bits and pieces of this in other fora, um, you know, other scholarly forums, ba basically focused on um, higher education. Um, uh, in particular, I gave a talk a couple of years ago at MIT, where I gave um, an earlier version of this talk. It wasn't quite as well developed, but many of the key points were there. Uh, but this is where it's all coming together. And I've presented parts of this at Yale, at the Indian Institute for Advanced Study in Shimla, and at the Indira Gandhi National Center here in India. So this is just by way of introduction. And may I, with your permission, uh, start to uh, share my screen? It'll make it much more efficient mm -hmm. if I do so. Okay. Okay, I think you should be able to see my screen now. We can. 
Okay, the full screen now, right? Yes, it's there. Okay, excellent. So let me plunge right in. Uh, the, the, the talk can be viewed as a challenge to this statement, which is from a volume that I think many of you would be familiar with. This is the three volume magisterial a history of the university in Europe by Walter Reig. The very first paragraph basically claims that the university is a European institution, a community of teachers and taught with certain rights, with autonomy, and with the um, award of publicly recognized degrees, and that it was a creation of medieval Europe, which was the Europe of papal Christianity. So um, now the interesting thing is that uh, the, the, it's not that the contributions of India and higher education were entirely unknown in the West. Uh, I'm thinking of the great uh, scholar of, actually he started out in bio, biochemistry, but later became uh, one of the foremost scholars of China and of Chinese, that is Joseph Needham, who was the master of Keyes College in Cambridge. Uh, in his, uh, one of his talks, he basically said, that when Alexander the Great uh, came to India, to Takshila in the fourth century BC, they found a university there, the like of which had not been seen in Greece and uh, was still existing when the Chinese pilgrim Fashian uh, came in about 400 AD. And later on, the torch of learning moved to Buddhist Nalanda and Bihar. Um, and uh, in the seventh century, uh, when Zhuensang uh, came to India, it was still there. But however, uh, the full extent of this history has not been shared. And that is what I want to do today, at least in summary form. I think we could spend days here going over the nuances and all of the detail uh, that is out there that I've tried to collect over the last eight years or so. Uh, but I will try and give you an overview. I will take about, about 30 minutes and then hopefully the remainder of the time, another 30 minutes, can be for a discussion, which I, I will personally find very stimulating uh, because I think all of you are scholars who have looked at different aspects of the functioning of the university around the world. Okay, so just to contextualize everything, uh, this is a map that took me about a couple of days to create. Essentially what I did is that I have mapped out the three major trade routes that connected the three major civilizations uh, of the ancient world, that is India, China, and then of course, uh, the Persian and the Greek civilizations, um, uh, basically. And these were the three major roads. Uh, the, uh, in the North, you have what is known as the Silk Road, uh, which we are all familiar with now, especially because of the Belt and Road Initiative of Xi Jinping. Uh, the second road was the Persian Royal Road, which was created by the Achaemenid Empire in Iran. And then basically uh, it continues till the present day. And then the third road, which was called the Northern Road or the Uttarapath in Sanskrit, which connected the major cities in North India. Now, the interesting thing is that all of these roads came together uh, in the city of Takshila, which is right there. You see the blue star right there where all these three roads come together and that's Takshila. So not surprisingly, uh, this is something that is not really talked about when people discuss Takshala, but until you understand uh, why Takshala was where it was and why did it achieve the prominence that it did, um, all that becomes very clear if you take a look at its geographic location. So basically Takshala connects the three major roads of the ancient world. Now, where exactly is Takshala? Takshala is just across the border uh, 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 with India in Pakistan. In fact, it's a suburb of their capital city, Islamabad. And uh, uh, it basically uh, in the north connects to the Silk Road, in the east uh, to the uh, Northern Road of India and in the west to the Persian Royal Road. Now, um, within India, there, there are some other roads which connect to other parts and they then connect to the seven major centers of learning that I will talk about today, Takshala, of course, then Vallabhi, which is in the West, which is the star that you see in the West. And then five stars, a couple of which are on top of each other that you see in the East. That is Nalanda, Vikramshil, Jagaddal, Sompura, Udantapuri. Uh, so those are the five that are there in the East. Okay. Now, just to contextualize this in, um, in the context of the other institutions of higher learning, 
Takshila, of course, starts from somewhere around the sixth century BC, may have been a couple of hundred years, a couple of um, uh, hundred years earlier than that also, seventh century BC also is possible. Um, uh, around the fourth century uh, BC, you have the uh, Academy of Plato, the uh, Lyceum of Aristotle, and Antioch and Pergamon also uh, come in thereafter. But remember, these were not universities. These were schools, which meant that only the learning pertaining to a particular school was available, but not everything else. In China also, you had uh, Tai Shui and Nanjing. And in Korea, you had Tai Hak. In Japan, uh, you had others as well. But the interesting thing is that none of these really became um, full-fledged universities in the sense that we understand them today, because most of these were imperial training academies or sectarian schools. Uh, and then, of course, uh, later on in the 5th century uh, uh, AD uh, to 12th century AD, we have Nalanda. Vallabhi is from the 6th to the 8th century. Vikramshil, Odantapuri, Jagaddal, and Sompura are from the 8th to the 12th. And then around the same time, you see the University of uh, Karwayun in Morocco, interestingly enough, founded by a woman. And as, as I will argue, Vallabhi also that you see above there, 6th century AD to 8th century AD, was also founded by a woman and uh, focused on women's education, though Karwayin um, did not focus on women's education uh, in Morocco. And then, of course, you have Al-Azhar, uh, which survives to the present day, uh, that is in Egypt. So of these, the only ones that survive to the present day are the last two that I mentioned. Now this, this uh, I hardly need to go through this particular chart. This is a list of the, uh, the 60 or so universities in Europe in the order of their founding. I will not touch upon that. And the same thing in the United States, the, the first 60 or so uh, founded there. This is, this is really for audiences that may not be familiar with this full history. But um, I thought it is important to contextualize it. I don't want to uh, suffer from the same um, inattention uh, to others that uh, I'm accusing uh, others of. So I need to certainly, so it's there for that reason, but you're all familiar with this. Now, the other chart that you need to understand to contextualize it, I've given you the geography of it. Let, let me now give you the economics of it. Now, this chart I have summarized from Angus Madison's magnum opus um, that he published in 2001, where he looked at the long-term dynamics of economies in the world. So basically, you see here uh, the, uh, the, uh, the shares of the various economies in the world at that time, which you see uh, listed here. So uh, what is interesting is that for almost 1,000 years, uh, India accounts for somewhere between 30% to one third of the world GDP. China is about a quarter for these 1,000 years. And this uh, persists till about 1500 CE when Europe starts to catch up. And uh, that is when the dynamics change. That is uh, for, for about 400 or so years. Uh, but this is extremely important to understand because this uh, will make you, uh, this, is the re this is one of the reasons why India was so prominent. Uh, and then of course, at different times, France, Germany, United Kingdom, the former USSR, and the United States basically achieved prominence in terms of global shares of world GDP. Uh, and then of course, now Asia is rising again. So I think it's very important to contextualize uh, everything in this diagram. The other way to understand the economics portion of it is to look at this center of gravity uh, of the world economy. If you look at the world map and you put, uh, and you weight it by economic activity, uh, the center of gravity uh, 2000 years ago was exactly in Takshila. And then of course, with the rise of Europe, it moves to Europe and then North America. In 1950, it reaches its westward apogee and then comes back. And uh, by 2025, in the next five to 10 years, it'll come back to this region. So this basically gives you an appreciation of the global dynamics. Now, the other thing that you have to understand why these universities became so prominent is again, this is something that most people in Europe do not realize. Philosophy did not begin in Greece, though many Europeans claim that it did. Uh, but uh, disinterested observers, in particular Ben Ami Scharfstein, uh, the professor emeritus of philosophy at uh, 
Hebrew University in Jerusalem. In his book, he very clearly lays out this table, which I have taken directly from his book. It's, um, it's a screenshot where he argues very convincingly and correctly, I believe, that philosophy begins 300 years or 400 years before any other place in India. Um, and uh, that I think uh, also, by the way, uh, these individuals that I have mentioned here were uh, Udalaka Aruni and Yagya Valkya uh, also uh, uh, lived around the same place as Takshala. And then the other thing to recognize is that, uh, again, most people associate India with the mystic East. Uh, Professor McEvery, who was a professor at Duke, uh, he argued very convincingly that every rational discipline that existed in Europe and in Greece in particular existed in India, and then of course, a lot more besides. So this, I think, will help you contextualize everything. Now, let me just share with you uh, one major thing about universities that is extremely important to understand. And I uh, say this as somebody who basically focuses on the study of institutions. And so therefore, uh, the universities suffer from what economists call a triple failure. That is they exhibit externalities, public goods and asymmetric information. Therefore, you cannot rely on the market mechanism to provide good universities uh, to you. In fact, you have to fix the market in multiple ways. And my talk really is about 18 ways in which these three externalities are patched uh, in India first, then in Europe, then in the United States, and indeed pretty much everywhere in the world. Now, why? So let me focus on externalities for a minute. Externalities are important because in a university, you cannot let uh, people who have the ability to pay into the university. Why? Because the brightest kids and the brightest professors, the brightest, the brightest uh, students uh, who, whom you want to attract may not be able to pay for the university education. And this is extremely important because students, uh, bright students and bright professors uh, create uh, an externality, a positive externality for everybody else. And therefore you cannot let the market mechanism function you need to subsidize higher education for that reason. And also because it's a public good and also because there is asymmetric information. So I'm not going to go through this whole table with you, partly because uh, uh, this is uh, something that uh, all of us are familiar with. What I've tried to do is make a list of uh, the major innovations that happened in higher education in India. This includes, the first is the definition of the university. That is all subjects must be taught. And in Takshila, I, I have the slides to back it up. If you are interested, all subjects were taught as was the case with the other six universities. They were residential, they were global. They had secular education plus religious education. All seven of them had peer review, science, financial assistance, degrees, academic repositories such as libraries. They had academic freedoms, admission standards, public funding, endowments, competing centers, autonomy, corporate form, centralized university form. And one of them, only one of them had women's education. So I'm not going to go through all 18 of them. I have evidence, I'm happy in the discussion to pull up the slides for every one of these. I will only focus in the next 10 minutes that I have on six of them because these were the most striking ones. And then we can have a discussion uh, about uh, the, six, the six that I'm presenting or the other 12 that I have left out, happy to do so uh, in uh, whichever order you want, okay. By the way, just so that you understand my point of view on this, I believe that apart from 18, there were six major innovations in Europe and North America. So Europe recreates these 18 that I talked about. Um, there is no evidence of borrowing, adds three more, uh, two of which basically come from outside the university. These are the scientific method and learned societies. Um, these uh, happen all over Europe, especially in England and in France. Uh, and then, of course, Germany brings in the unity of teaching and research. That is the Humboldt model. And then USA, in my view, adds three more institutional innovations. The unitary governance, right? That is the president is somebody who controls the university, all the non-academic parts, all the administrative functions. That is an American innovation. Uh, and here you see a portrait of Charles Eliot at Harvard who, uh, who, uh, who, who did this, who exemplified this to the highest degree. Then there is the... Um, innovation of alumni governance that I have written about, 
also from around the same time, also pioneered by Harvard, but within a couple of years imitated by every American university. And then um, 150 years later, 130 years later, the Bayh-Dole Act, which basically makes available the fruits of research to uh, industry. Uh, so these are the six additional ones. I will not talk about it. I've just uh, mentioned these here. Okay, so in this table, again, um, this is an overview. Uh, I, won't, uh, I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, essentially what I've done here is it's a seven by 18 matrix. It tells you exactly, and I'm prepared to defend this whichever way you want, uh, about when these innovations occurred and where uh, in these seven. Okay. All right. So the first major innovation that I'm going to talk about is academic freedom. See, for a university to thrive, there must be a culture of academic freedom. Again, what most people do not realize is that much more so than Europe, India is characterized by academic freedom. This was noted by Max Weber. I have the quote from him from 1923. Uh, he he uh, basically says that it was tolerance was absolute, nahezu absolute, that is complete, that is almost complete in terms of religious and philosophical doctrines that could be discussed. So you don't have evidence of book burning or people being imprisoned or anything like that, that you regularly see in China, that you regularly see in Greece, that you regularly see in Europe, none of that is there. Uh, similarly, uh, the, uh, the, the, I, I have given you a quote from uh, the second century BC about, uh, this is by the way from a text called Milin the Panha, that is the questions of King Menander, who was a Greek prince who became the king of Takshala and then became a Buddhist. So there's a conversation. This is the equivalent of the dialogues of Plato. It's a fabulous text. If any of you have a chance, uh, please do look it up uh, where the academic freedom is explained. So the, so the king wants to have a dialogue with the great uh, philosopher Nagasena. And Nagasena says, so how do you want to talk? Do you want to talk as king's talk or do you want to talk as scholar's talk? So the king says, tell me what is the difference? He says, when kings talk, if somebody disagrees, they chop off their heads. But when scholars disagree, they basically use that to improve their dialogue. So the king says, I will talk as scholars do. So anyway, so this is a very early, clear statement of academic freedom that you see. Uh, the second very interesting episode that you see is from the great uh, scholar, uh, Xuan Sang, who came to India. Uh, he, by the way, is a household name in China. All the kids learn his book, Journey to the West, which really is what his trip to India was all about. So what is interesting is that he had a public debate with uh, Pragya Deva in India in the presence of the great King Harshavardhana. 3000 scholars were in attendance. And as it happened, uh, because this debate, this debate lasted for three days, their voices got raised. So after Xuan Sang goes back to China, Pragya Deva writes a letter to him in China and basically says, I apologize for raising my voice. And Xuan Sang writes back saying, I also apologize to you for raising my voice. So this is the degree, this was the kind of house rules of debate. By contrast, here, uh, the, uh, you, don't, you, you find that Socrates basically was put to death. Why? Because in Greek, it says, and this is, I've, I've taken this from the Loeb edition, for hetera de daimonia kaina, for believing in gods that were anathema to the, uh, to the Greeks. And Diogenes, Diogenes Laertius mentions that this public charge sheet in Greek um, was posted in Athens for 600 years. Now, so this, was, so this was the first major innovation. The second innovation was the corporate form. Now remember, the reason why the Buddhists had the universities in India is because they came up with the world's first corporation, which was the Buddhist Sangha. I gave a full hour long talk on this. We could spend days talking about the innovations. Uh, and this is the reason why all the great universities of India were Buddhist because they developed a technology of the self-perpetuating corporation. The Buddha himself does it. And this is codified in an 8,000 page Tibetan translation of a Sanskrit original called the Mool, Saras, Saras, uh, Mool Sarvastivad Vinaya, which lays out the running of a Sangha or the Buddhist monastery and the university in great detail. It has never been translated uh, completely. Gregory Chopin in UCLA has made this his life's work. 
He has 60, pa pa 60 papers on this, every one of which I have read. And they all tell you about different aspects of the functioning of this monastery, and in particular, the university, which um, inherited this monastic code. So I've covered this in my Nirmal Bose Memorial Lectures in IGNC. IGNCA, I will not talk about it more here. The third thing that I want to talk about is the relationship with the state. Now, the state pretty much leaves the universities alone. I have an eyewitness account from a Tibetan source. This was lost for about 150 years uh, from, um, uh, the, from a journal that was published uh, 150 years ago. This is a morning assembly in 1062 at Vikram Shield, one of the great universities. Now, what is interesting is that the king comes in uh, and attends the assembly of thousands and he sits in the audience and nobody rises for him. When Atisha, the vice chancellor, whose picture is given here from the Tibetan source, rise, comes, everybody rises, includes, including the king. And what is interesting is that the same Atisha was the vice chancellor of Nalanda. So he was the joint vice chancellor of, the, of two major universities and a very different relationship of church and state. Now, from the Tibetan source, again, I point out that when the King Rampala was the crown prince, he was a student at Vikramshil. He was expelled by Atisha. And later on, he becomes the king, but his respect for Atisha basically never diminishes. So that is, the, that is something which everybody in India has forgotten. I had to spend years to pull out these references and um, the originals, because this is one of the most interesting aspects of the Indian system. It's almost unbelievable that something like this could happen. By contrast, right up until 1794, Immanuel Kant is threatened with a jail term by King William II of Prussia because he, he dares to question the received wisdom about some scholars pertaining to the Bible. Essentially, he says that the Bible would be much better off if we remove the miracle aspect of it. It's a very logical point of view that he wants to point out but he's almost thrown in jail. And the famous scholar Jacques Derrida writes about this conflict of the faculties at Columbia a couple of, he wrote about this a couple of years ago. So the stark contrast with India is prevalent here. Very quickly, I will in the next few minutes give you three other major innovations. Um, there were admission standards. Remember I mentioned to you that um, there are positive externalities in higher education. So you have to select the very best students at Oxford you have to be selective. Um, at any great university, you have to be selective. Uh, Nalanda and Vikram Shield were extremely selective. Uh, they took only 10 to 20% of the people who had the gumption to go up to the gates of these universities where they would be interviewed by the six top professors. These were called the Dwar Pandits. These would have been the distinguished professors of their time. Their names are known, which I have given here. But you can imagine a daunting um, a process. It's like uh, you're coming to Oxford and you have to be interviewed at the gates by Simon Marginson and the other worthies at Oxford. Uh, and only then are you let in. And uh, uh, Xuan Sang and Yi Jing, the Chinese uh, visitors say that the pass percentage was very, very low. It was also a very secular education. That is to say, uh, and this is from Yi Jing, from his travelogue in India, he says that uh, there were lay scholars, not just religious scholars, who basically went to the great universities of Nalanda and Wallopi, and once they passed out of these gates, their, uh, uh, their fame uh, shone all over India. They got feudal estates. Their names were inscribed in pillars and things like that. So secular education was there. By contrast, most people in um, England have forgotten, and especially at Oxford, that uh, until 1854, you could not matriculate at Oxford unless you signed the 39 articles of the Anglican faith. And um, uh, professors had to do it until much later. Cambridge abolished it in 1770s. Oxford was a little bit slower. What is interesting, by the way, Charles Babbage, he could not graduate from Cambridge because he refused to sign these articles. Later, they hired him in uh, Charles Babbage, you know, the great um, scholar of algorithms. He, they was, he was hired as the Lucasian professor, you know, um, the same chair that Newton had. But by that time, he was so um, annoyed that he never really came back uh, to Cambridge and never really gave any talk or lecture uh, at Cambridge. So remember, by contrast, 
um, Oxford and Cambridge and almost all the universities of Europe are very restrictive in terms of whom they admit there. And this is, I'll close with this. This is in some sense, absolute stunning achievement. Uh, women's education in Europe, of course, there are a few women scholars that are known from the 13th, 13th century onwards, but only a few, one or two here and there, and they all had to struggle to even get an education. Umberto Eco, the great Italian scholar has written about this. By contrast in 535 CE, and it took me several years to get the inscriptional evidence. Most people in India have forgotten this, but Princess Dudda, she founded a monastery both for men and women. There were 17 separate one that seven, 17 separate monasteries, three of which for women were for women. Uh, and so men and women were educated simultaneously here and they were simultaneously educated for 200 years until this was destroyed by uh, the invasions from the Arab invasion from Sin. But for 200 years, there was secular and religious education for men and women. Now, this is such a, such a shocking claim. Uh, I myself refuse to believe it. So I said, look, there must be evidence of educated women scholars in the Indian literature. And this too has been ignored. So uh, around the same time, in the seventh century AD, there is evidence uh, in uh, one of the greatest uh, uh, books in Sanskrit, Bhavbhuti's Malti Madhava, of women and men being educated, going to different cities, in this case, Padmavati, which was another center of learning for higher education. So it mentions Kamandaki, Bhurivasu, Devavrata, and Saudamani, who were students together away from home uh, in the city of Padmavati. And the same thing, and I won't belabor the point now, uh, Kalidasa, uh, who is one of the greatest uh, authors of all time. In, in Europe, he's called the Shakespeare of India. In India, he's called, uh, in India, Shakespeare is called the Kalidasa of Europe. Um, there, he also talks about um, uh, a woman scholar, uh, Kaushiki. She's called upon to educate among, uh, to adjudicate amongst other scholars. So let me pause here. Uh, basically, let me uh, let me uh, pretty much uh, go back to this table. And let me leave it here. I won't go to go through the other 12. It'll take at least an hour if I do so, but I have the slides ready in case anybody is interested. So Simon, at this point, let me turn the floor back to you. I thought I would very quickly give you this 50,000 foot view of higher education over 1800 years in India. Well, thank you, Shalindra. That was just wonderful. And the slides, of course, were, re you know, as well as your, your voice, your explanation, the slides were very effective as well. And I think there's so much we have to learn from history and, you know, we should do more of this kind of thing. We should do more of this sort of historically rooted discussion. I'm going to start the discussion. We've got several people already indicating they want to talk to you. I want to start with um, some reflections on the axial age and that extraordinary time between 600 and 300 BCE when we saw, or not quite simultaneously, but close in time, the Buddha, uh, mm -hmm. Confucius and Mencius in, in China and Plato's Academy and, you know, the, and the preceding philosophers in Greece. Um, just extraordinary what happened then. And we are still in this world now in many respects. I mean, those three bodies of thought are very much alive and influential um, in, and, uh, and continue, you know, presumably will continue to be in for the foreseeable future. The key, the key ideas that emerged then were so, so um, important. Um, but let's reflect on the three regions for a moment, you know, the sort of, in a lot of ways, the, the great regions of Eurasia, um, you know, the West, which around Greece at that time, and then through Rome more broadly, uh, you, have, uh, you have India and you have East Asia. And when you compare the situation then and the situation now, I think the three regions are playing out differently. Because in East Asia, Confucianism in, you know, it's variants like Mencius and uh, the Neo-Confucians and New Confucianism in the 20th century, 
Confucianism remains very, very uh, important, but what's striking is how similar Confucian ideas as understood at a popular level, as a, at a sort of family or social level now are to the original ideas. You know, that there's, as you can, you can see the, the, uh, the, the, those original texts still being played out in front of you now. Um, it's a bit different when you go to Greece because Zeno and Plato and Aristotle tremendously foundational to, you know, Western thought, but there's quite a lot of distance now between the Greek philosophers in ancient Greece and say Kant and Hegel, you know, there's a much bigger gap in terms of development or change, uh, displacement, you might say, between the, you know, the foundational ideas and the, and the more modern manifestations compared to China with this, this high level of continuity. What about India? I mean, what's happened there? How much impact does that, you know, period of, of immensely creative thought nurtured in these remarkable institutions that you've told us about today, how much of that still resonates now? How foundational and how significant is it in modern South Asia? There's a huge resonance, huge resonance. And uh, the reason why this, uh, but it's a little complicated. So let me just give you a short version and I'm happy to have a dialogue uh, about this in, in some detail. There are not one, but two separate traditions in India. They are the Vedic tradition and the shamanic tradition, right? So in the Axial Age, the Axian Zeit, the Axian Zeit that Spengler talked about that you referred to, um, the churning basically comes from the, 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 uh, the uh, shamanic tradition, right? This is the tradition of the Buddha and the Mahavira. And they basically take to task a lot of the shortcomings that they perceive in the Vedic tradition as it exists around 500 BC. So it is not just one tradition, but it is what I would call two traditions that basically have, as it were, jockeyed for supremacy uh, all throughout uh, the history of India. And by and large, they have coexisted peacefully. They've had debates and discussions, but no bloodshed per se, uh, you know, amongst themselves. At least uh, internally, there was none. Uh, the bloodshed that you see, and I've just alluded to it, basically came from outside because all seven of these institutions were destroyed by barbarian invaders. Uh, the first one being the White Huns from the North, right in 450 AD and all the way down to uh, the invaders from Afghanistan who came in the 12th century. So all that um, is a separate discussion. But um, so the short answer to your question is still highly resonant and many of the same uh, challenges are still being discussed. And I will close with one point. Uh, the person who gave India the Indian constitution, Ambedkar, he is, he came from the lowest, uh, uh, the lowest caste, right? Uh, and it is one of the great uh, achievements of modern India that somebody who uh, was born as what was formerly called an untouchable basically wrote India's constitution. He was deeply influenced by the shamanic tradition, in particular, the Buddhist tradition. And throughout his writings, he goes back to the foundational values of these universities, which were largely Buddhist. So it is deeply resonant. And then of course, uh, the Vedic uh, uh, tradition also has had a lot of reformation. And, uh, uh, and uh, so that, that dialogue and that churning continues till today. Simon? Thank you. Now we've got a lot of a lot of fan mail, a lot of people saying what a good presentation this was, and is, and uh, we've also got some questions. I'd like to bring in the very first questioner from Jammu and Kashmir, uh, Amit Kumar Bali. Amit, would you like to unmute and come into the discussion, please? Hello. Uh, yes, yes I we am. can hear you. Hi. Yes, I am Amit Bali from Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, wants to know that irrespective of having very old establishment, universe, established university in India, my question is why the scholar of this university is unknown uh, uh, to of all of us uh, as compared to, uh, as we, uh, as uh, Plato and Aristotle, we know more. I think the fault is with us in India. I think uh, we have not fully shaken off 
uh, the yoke of colonialism and the colonial modes of thought. And uh, I think uh, we have not really asked questions which are Indic centric, which stem from the reality as was experienced in our part of the world. Rather, and I, I noticed that uh, Professor Maria Ahmed also uh, alludes to this in the, in the chat, uh, and I'll be happy to engage with her as well. But I think uh, the time is right now to basically have a proper dialogue and say, look, this is what we did. This is what happened here. These were what we achieved. These were the limitations. And uh, this is what was achieved in China. This was what was achieved in Europe. This was what was achieved in Iran, in uh, Northern Africa. And let us have a proper dialogue. And the whole point of my talk today was to share a framework. I mean, I'm sure this is one person's thinking, but to the extent that you find any resonance in it, we can have a dialogue, cross-cultural dialogue, as to what was available where and why and when and all of that. Thank you. Thank you, Shlendra, and thank you, Amit. Um, and our next question comes from Kriti Daga. Yeah, hi, Kriti. Hello, Kriti. Good, e good evening, sir. I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first is uh, the global institute, uh, the uh, in institutional innovation that table uh, that you yes. had uh, shown in your presentation. Could you highlight the global part of it? Yes, absolutely. And uh, the second is uh, when you were talking about uh, the uh, university teaching in, the, in terms of the economics of university teaching. So you mentioned uh, externalities, public good, uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the third uh, uh, this asymmetric, so, information. Asymmetric, asymmetric information asymmetric information mm. so could you just uh, throw some light on the externalities part yes and by the way this goes to the heart of the university form the reason why we need so many innovations one after another is because more than any other institution there is market failure in the university form so first of all why externalities you see if um, I'm admitted to a great university and I'm not so great and I'm not so good, I not only will not be able to benefit as much from the university, but also I prevent others from benefiting because my discussions with my professors and, and with my student colleagues will not be of the same caliber, right? So therefore it's in your interest, all great universities of the world want to be selective because they want to create absolutely the best and the most dynamic class possible. And therefore you cannot use the market mechanism to choose students. You cannot choose, Oxford cannot choose the people on the basis of their ability to pay, the biggest donors to the university. I know there were some scandals occasionally that erupted in the eighties and nineties when it was kind of hinted that people bought their way because of donations and uh, the reason why that is frowned upon is because then you lower the tone of the university as a whole. Um, so that is one. And then the uh, asymmetric information is also very interesting. I have a quote right at the end from Socrates uh, in Plato's Protagoras, where he says, I, I will just give you the summary version of it. And he, this is the asymmetric information part. He says, when you go and buy food and drink, uh, this is in the dialogues of Plato, when you go and buy food and drink, you can take it in a container and examine it before you eat it. But you cannot examine education before uh, experiencing it, by which time it's too late, right? So, so, he, so even Plato and uh, Socrates, they were familiar basically with uh, these. So, and then finally, your second part, what were uh, the innovations in Europe? So the way I think of it, Europe, first of all, recreates these 18 innovations. And this is a hypothesis that I have which I will examine in my book, that the order in which these 18 innovations come in India, and we have dates for most of them, is pretty much the same order in which they come in Europe, right? So let's take the first one, uh, which is all subjects should be taught there. That is the definition of a university. Well, Takshala was not a centralized university. It was a co-location of scholars, just as Oxford was, just as Cambridge was, just as Paris and Bologna were, uh, they were all co-locational scholars. That's how all of them start. 
And later on, they become centralized. You know, then they have centralized universities, centralized funding, all kinds of things happen. All the 18 basically happen in that. So the three that, uh, so 18, Europe recreates those 18. And that is fascinating to me that they come up with the same solutions to the same three problems that I've identified in almost the same order. And this is what is the fun part of my academic journey uh, on this problem is that they recreate these 18, then they add three more, two of which come from outside the university. That is the scientific method from Bacon. And then the learned societies that is, uh, you know, the Royal Society and the, um, and so on, and, the, and their counterparts uh, in the rest of Europe. And then of course, uh, Humboldt, the Humboldtian university around the turn of uh, the 19th century. So those were the three innovations there. And then America borrows these uh, 20, uh, 21 innovations and adds three more. Uh, unitary control, alumni governance and the Bayh-Dole Act. And uh, I believe these are the 24 innovations that I focus on um, over the over 2,600 years. Kirti, does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Uh, just uh, before you close, uh, the first part that you answered that university should attract the best and most dynamic lot given today's situation, uh, marketization process is the soul of uh, you know how universities function so isn't that a contradictory thing to what you are saying no remember no no not at all so let me give you the case of india which is where i guess both of us are currently um, all higher education is is required to be not for profit and that is an explicit explicit statement of the fact that the market forces cannot be allowed to work uh, here so I, I won't go into how competition can still happen. Remember, there's a way for competition still to happen without the market. That is, my, that is the subject of my paper on alumni governance. This was the great innovation of America, how they brought in competition for prestige amongst alumni of Yale and Harvard and Columbia and Purdue and Northwestern and uh, Notre Dame. Uh, you know, they compete for prestige and that's how they bring in competition for faculty, for students and for funding. Simon, back to you. Thank you. Great. Now, what I'd like to do now is take Gillian Hogg, then uh, Bala Subramayan, uh, Chandra Mahon, Maria Ahmad, uh, Indira Nagesh, uh, Maxwell Ado, if we have time, Amar Deep Kumar, if we have time. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, and can I bring in Gillian Hogg at this point? Um, good afternoon. Yes, thank you. It's been a very interesting talk. And um, I think the, the point, my question is the discussing the market, the three market failures and the, the external, externalities and what does that say um, about the processes of the market and the limits of the market. Um, I'm very interested in the sort of the social equality yes. dynamics or it's great to have the people selected according to their suitability, which is what academic selection is. Right. And then to men, but how do we maintain the public good? And it's very interesting to see, you know, that that was the origin of the universities even so many, uh, you know, so many hundreds of years ago. And the things that we have in common um, and how we can indeed, as somebody said, uh, to, to kind of make sure that we safeguard that principle of, um, of of the academic selection and and but maintain the public good in the face of the sort of alumni competition and market forces. Right. By the way, I view alumni competition as absolutely a good thing. I think uh, the alumni of Oxford and Cambridge and University College London all of at, ought to compete with each other. I think that competition is much more subdued in Europe than it is in the United States. But let me completely echo your sentiment, uh, Professor Hogg, uh, as follows. I'll give you actually the most striking demonstration that I know of, of the difference between a corporate um, form and the university form. By the way, in India especially, many of our uh, art leaders have made the mistake of bringing in corporate thinking in universities. And I'll tell you why that is fatal. I cannot, I cannot tell you how fatal that is, and I'll, take, and, I'll, I'll, and I'll give you very quickly the reason for it. In a, in a corporation, you can do seven things. You can hire people, 
You can tell them what to do. You can observe what they do. You can um, promote them. You can rotate them. You can incentivize them and you can fire them. In a great university, you can do only one of those things. In fact, not even that. Even you, so even the hiring, for example, at a great university like Harvard is not done on the basis of whims and fancies of the department chair. A committee basically, uh, uh, if they want a new microeconomist, and I'm describing the process that Janusz Kornai uh, describes at Harvard in the economics department, that it's not the chair, department chair who decides who's going to be hired. They, they poll the peers and then they choose the best person to hire. It's the same at Oxford, right? If you want to hire the next professor of education, I, I imagine that is how Simon was hired. They poll everybody and say, who's the very best? And they reach out to that person and say, look, um, we want you to come. So basically the market mm -hmm. forces do not operate at all. And uh, more importantly, uh, they cannot be allowed to operate. And so how does a great university get its job done? It's by building the culture of collaboration because it is only through peer evaluation that you figure out the other seven things that I talked about, the other six things. That is, observe what people do, tell them what, nobody tells them what to do. Um, and uh, promotions are by peer review, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, building the culture of academic freedom and autonomy, where on academic matters, even the university president, president doesn't tell you anything, that is critical. Mm -hmm. Yes. Bala? Bala Subramanian, can you come in, please? Hello, Bala. Can you hear me, please? Yeah, we can hear you. OK. Uh, basically, my question is, um, in, in your uh, presentation, uh, is that, uh, one of the areas which I felt um, um, you could throw light on is uh, the transmission of knowledge through sea roads. The area you covered is mostly the land-based land uh, connectivity to other parts of the world from India. But at the same time, in the period that you're covering, the southern part of India, the peninsular part of India, which had much more sea connections, also produced uh, knowledge, literature, et cetera. So for example, the Sangam literature. Yes. How would you, can, how would you um, uh, categorize them? You know, they may not be uh, universities in the same sense in which you are, uh, you are institutionalized uh, setups. That's one question. The second question is you mentioned about the tension between Vedic and shamanic uh, traditions. Yes. And if you take the history of um, Pandian kingdoms and other kingdoms, there was a lot of tension between the two, which uh, also resulted in certain violence and, and, and so on. So. I was wondering whether you could also take that into account that the tension did exist between them. And then that also led to certain levels in which the kings were involved in violently suppressing some of the traditions. Yes. Yes. So um, very quickly, uh, by the way, we can have a long discussion on this. It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a subject of great fascination for me. So I, I, uh, for the purpose of this talk, I did not put in any of the centers in the South. Partly because um, none of them really became universities in the sense that these seven became. And I'm thinking of Kantalur Shalai, you know, on the border between Tamil Nadu and Kerala currently. I'm thinking of the great uh, Sangam um, centers such as Madurai. I'm thinking of Amravati and others. But they never really had the breadth and the depth of these seven universities, partly because uh, it may have been uh, the fact that they were not on these great trade routes. By the way, Wallaby was the exception, even though it was even though Shwen Sang came by road. Uh, the reason why Wallaby became prominent is because of sea trade. That Wallaby was the gateway to northern India, just as the southern ports were the gateway, you know, in Kochi and so on in the south. Wallaby was the great gateway to northern India, and when it was destroyed, it became Surat, and when Surat fell into dis into disuse, it became Mumbai uh, or Bombay. Uh, so uh, so sea uh, sea. Wallaby was primarily a seafaring city. So I think uh, to some extent, your point is reinforced even in these northern universities. Now, with regard to the sea route, uh, there were several sea routes. As you know, there was one which came to uh, Tamralipti, which is uh, Haldia today, uh, which is uh, at the mouth of the Ganges, which you see at the mouth of the northern road as well. So in fact, uh, Shwensang 
comes through uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, sea route and then leaves through the northern route. So that is very much there. And you're absolutely right that um, many of the sea uh, traditions basically were important in the south. Now, with regard to the violence between the Vedic and the shamanic tradition, most of it is basically violent arguments. There is very little evidence of actual violence. I actually spent many months looking at the direct evidence in particular, I trust you're familiar with Periyar Puranam, which is where the evidence of violence of the Shaivites against the Jains is supposedly there. But I looked for um, the inscriptions in Madurai, which supposedly had it. I couldn't find any. I looked at all the publications of the Archaeological Survey of India. Nothing there. Most of the references to archaeological evidence there are non-existent. And most interestingly, uh, the... Um, uh, the, the Madurai continues to be a Jain city much after uh, the date of violence uh, that, is, that is mentioned there. So I think by and large, this was mostly peaceful. There are a few instances which I'm in the process of documentation. I think over, uh, I think 1800 years or so, there are five or six instances of violence that are there from within India. But most of these are curated, are, are corrected uh, very, very quickly. Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you both. Uh, Maria, Maria Ahmad, please. Hello, Maria. Hello. Um, actually, I'm a, a PhD student at University of Auckland and it's 2 a.m. here. So <laughs> my voice be a bit difficult to understand my thing. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mehta, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, my point, as I have already mentioned in my written chat, yes. was that yes. um, our responses to ourselves, in a way, are shaped by, I'm actually, I'm also um, an Asian scholar. That's why I'm using the pronoun our. Our yes. responses to ourselves are shaped by how we are viewed by our cultural others. So that's make us, in a way, rewrite our histories, again, as cultural appropriation. So uh, I just want to know that how do you think about it? Because I'm studying about that how universities, which are exist in present day India and Pakistan, are created on the cultural contact zone that's created during colonial period. So the point of friction, which were emerged on that contact zone, like democratization of education, sure. utilitarian knowledge, secular knowledge, women education, have become focus of our rewriting of our history in a way. Yeah. So how in a way we are actually doing the right justice to our history by just focusing on those points that turn out to be the point of contention on that colonial context zone. Thank you very much. So first of all, uh, I'm impressed that you would be up at 2 a.m. Uh, Maria, you know, for this talk. I'm honored actually. Uh, so thank you for being here. And I think you raise a very important point, which I wholeheartedly uh, support. Uh, so uh, by the way, um, the interaction between the Greeks and Takshila, the interaction between the Chinese and Takshila or the Chinese and Nalanda or, or Wallabi was very respectful. I think nobody wanted to in any way, shape or form other uh, the other, so to speak. Uh, it was very respectful. And by and large, they uh, were very open about this. I think it becomes quite different later on for a variety of reasons that we do not, that I think you probably understand uh, better than I do. But um, the short answer to your question is, it is horrifying the degree to which we have taken as given that this is the right way to do things and this is the right way to organize things. I've been involved in some of the conversations around our national education policy, which was just released about a month ago in India. And so all of this, is being looked at with a fresh eye currently. And I can tell you that in the process, being involved in that process, I'm horrified by what I find. You know, for one thing, uh, I have just looked at the statutes of the top 50 central universities in the country. It's a total mess. Can you believe the University of Delhi has 475 members of its governing board? How do you run? I mean, as a, as a student of institutions, how can you even run a meeting with 500 people? You know, where you want to get anything done. That is how dysfunctional many of these institutions have become. So uh, 
this is part of that larger enterprise of what you may call zero based budgeting right just going going back to the drawing board and rethinking how we need to uh, conduct all of these institutions i mean how do we need to regulate the conduct of these institutions starting with their governance i completely am of the view that unless you fix governance you cannot fix anything else so that is where some of us are trying to start uh, and then finally i'll just take one more minute to answer your point of view look i think uh, maria we cannot throw the baby out with the bath water i think uh, in the process of reclaiming our own space we cannot ignore the space that already has been carved out by these wonderful centers from outside of asia uh, primarily in europe and north america because they innovated in their own way as i said there is no evidence that i am aware of that links um you know the uh, universities of bologna paris and oxford and cambridge uh, to what happened in india or in uh, north africa for that matter uh so um so i cannot really claim so one must be mindful of their independent innovations and in a comparative sense learn from what they did and learn from where they built uh on top of what they did and uh, and basically revisit the questions that i talked about i believe the one thing that i would like to leave this audience with having you know for 8 years looked at the history of this uh, of higher education in six primary languages and seven secondary languages and 13 languages in all i'm humbled by you know just the breadth the sheer breadth of innovation that happens all over the world everybody is dealing with the same problems they come up with slightly different answers and it's a it's a tribute to our common humanity that when we put all of these together you realize that we are all trying to do the same thing though in uh, different ways thank you shalandra we i'm not going to stop there though i uh, i think we'll take one more question we usually bleed, bleed to about 305 uh and the last question will come from indira nagesh indira hi a uh, fantastic talk and i never knew we had an uh, exclusive women's university back in 1535 i mean that's something you know we have never been told it, it was like a, a discovery for me thank you very much fantastic talk um i come from a mathematical background and i'm i'm my research is predominantly applied mathematics um so in one of your slides you talk about um european scientific method um that was that as a unique um innovation by the europeans um i i don't know if i if i tend to agree with that in terms of mathematical innovations because if you look at baudhayana who who came up with you know the square roots the cube roots yeah. and even the pythagoras theorem or the bhaskaras and the aryabhatas you know they they came up with um, mathematical solutions which were rigorous um yes. and and how how do you say that you know the scientific method was something which was unique to europeans uh, as against uh, what we had done yeah well wait the so i say not the scientific method remember the scientific method is there in uh, in nalanda right we know we know from the work of shwen sang no uh, actually his disciple yi jing that um, first of all there were three libraries in nalanda each of which was nine stories high on top of the library there was an observatory mm. and uh, so and we know that aryabhata who was 50 miles away from nalanda in what was then called purushpura or patna that uh, uh, sorry pushpapura not purushpura that is peshawar um that is he's about 50 miles away from nalanda and he's called kulapa of an observatory right so here he is you know working on some of the greatest uh, mathematical innovations at that time and he heads an observatory and there is an observatory 50 miles away in nalanda as well mm. so the scientific method is there and i uh, and i have a whole slide on it i won't bore you with the details happy to have an offline conversation with you about that so i absolutely believe that the scientific method was there but the experimental method was not there right. so there's a difference right so bacon basically mm. comes up with formalizing the experimental method mm. and that was certainly not there mm. by the way the other thing which most people don't know is that the notion of statistics mm. uh, also originates in india also in aryabhata the first mm. person to define an average mm. see an average is a very peculiar thing mathematically because you throw away data right 
yeah. rather than looking at a hundred data points, I want to look at only one. You know, the average weight of the people in this room. Um, so it's it, it it does not come naturally. But the person who does it for the first time is Aryabhata, and not only does he have the notion of an average, but he has the notion of a weighted average. Hmm. And why does he come up with that? Well, because the king gave him a very peculiar problem. He said, "Tell me how much water is there in this lake." You know, if I need to fill this up, how much water would I need to divert from the river? So what he does is that he comes up with the method of taking sticks, creating a grid on the lake, taking sticks, take sticks, and identifying the depth of that um, lake at different points on the grid, mm -hmm. and then he takes the average of those, and then he multiplies it by the surface area, and that's how he comes up with the volume. So uh, all this is again something that was never taught to us in school. Sure. Um, uh, Professor Datta at the Indian Statistical Institute has written about this. He's gone back to the original texts and he's come up with that. And in your area, um, uh, uh, ma'am, um, the most fascinating uh, uh, work is actually in the south of India and in Kerala. Yeah. And most of it is in Malayalam. So uh, again, this has been demonstrated conclusively. There is the book by uh, this Princeton professor called The Crest of the Peacock, where um, she demonstrates that, um, that calculus pretty much was discovered much before Leibniz in um, South India. Uh, there is uh, the notion of infinite series. There is the notion of convergence. There is the notion of uh, uh, a derivative. And there is also, since you're a mathematician, you would appreciate this, there is also the derivative of the u over v form, right? We all know how to derive, uh, how to, uh, anybody who's taken elementary calculus knows how to derive the um, derivative of two functions, one over the other. Thank you. So Thank you. that is all there. So I'm, I'm completely in agreement with you. Simon, back to you. Thank you, Shalandra. Thank Look, you. that was, and, and yeah, and thank you also, Indira, for the last question. There is so much to, to say, isn't there? There's so much more to talk about, and there's so many more questions. I must apologize to Maxwell and to Amadeep, who were waiting for a while and have missed out. Um, so do come into our discussions next week. Um, we have a further dis presentation on India coming up next month from Nivedita uh, Sarkar. And, uh, I think we're beginning to develop a conversation about higher education in India, past as well as present, which I think is very fruitful. Um, but hopefully we'll have a good look at the new, the new higher education policy at some point as well. Uh, and so uh, let, me, uh, let me say to you, Shalendra, you added a great deal to our program and we'd really love to see you again. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Um, and uh, folks, uh, we've got... Um, International education back on the agenda next Tuesday. Kaho Mok and um, and Wei Yan Xiong from uh, Lingnan in Hong Kong are going to talk about the effects of the pandemic uh, on international student mobility and student aspirations in uh, China and Hong Kong SAR. So do join us next Tuesday for that discussion. Thanks uh, to you all. Thank you all for being here and uh, and contributing to the discussion. And thank you above all, Shalandra. Thank you. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you.